Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today uh, for the artist talk. Uh, I'm Habib Karadiyar Zamani. I'm the director and curator oftentimes here at the gallery. And uh, uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm hoping that you visited the gallery prior to the artist talk today. Uh, but uh, as you have noticed, there are two exhibits. One is a solo exhibit by artist uh, Alex Kritzelis. He's standing next to me. His work is in this component of the gallery. And then on the other side, uh, there's a concurrent exhibit that I organized to complement his. Uh, that deals with uh, similar themes. Uh, uh, I'll let Alex talk about his own work, uh, <coughs> but by the title alone, uh, you can see that there are references to myth and mythology. And I like how, um, in the case of both Alex's show and the, the group exhibit Greece, uh, these uh, themes run through the exhibits and uh, the influences of the past along with uh, uh, present contextualization uh, forms uh, very interesting uh, outputs, uh, creative outputs. So uh, I'd like to introduce Alex uh, first, uh, then we will go to the other side. I will introduce Olga Komondoras uh, and then Rachel Rajani. Uh, each will talk about their work. Uh, and then at the end, we can have some questions and answers. So thank you, and without further ado, Alex Kritzel. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your, of your day to be here with us. And um, I, I, I really like to, um, to recognize Habib for uh, having, having taken um, you know, time to put together the two exhibits, which I believe they are complementing each other. Um, and also for all of the work that he has done throughout the years here, as well as uh, with the kamikaze exhibit during the summer, which I have always found been kind of remarkable in terms of the energy and the range that it's brought to the center city. Um, I also want to recognize my wife, who is here from, uh, from the downtown part of Los Angeles, uh, keeping an eye on what I'm going to say, and maybe she will debrief me and help me a little bit later as to what I could have done a little bit better, maybe. Um, a little bit about me, just to give you uh, context. Um, I'm from Greece originally. Um, I did most of my education, if not all of the formal education in Europe. Um, after I finished from the academy, I went to London for my graduate work, and then I went to Italy for another two years of looking and, and studying. And uh, at the end of that period of time, I, I, I came to the United States, and I have been here 40 years. Uh, it's, it's been a remarkable journey, and along the way, um, from the beginning, I tried to, to shed some of the things that I was bringing along. Uh, in quotes, that was the reason that I left on the first place. There was an overwhelming presence of history everywhere that I would turn. There were things that reminded me of the past of my country, and to pull out of that and to find some other horizons, I had to really remove myself. And over the 40 years that I have been here, I have noticed that progressively I have been returning back to those things that I tried to get rid of at some point, because as it turns out, they were a lot deeper embedded into who I am. And um, in, in some respects, I'm a lot more comfortable with where I am today, because all of that you know, push and pull that took place for the last 40 years almost is out of the way. And I'm, 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 I'm a little bit more comfortable, if not very comfortable, inside my skin. Um, part of the reason that I use mythological subject matter here is because I believe that myths remain alive. Even though they may have been created for thousands of years, they have traveled, they have been reinvented, People use them as a way to speak to others about things that matter about our lives. And Prometheus is a character that struck me. It's pretty important to how people have evolved through time. He dared to disobey 
and to pass on to the people fire. And fire, of course, changed everything. It changed everything uh, to make it more complicated, to make it more daring, to make it more, more exciting, more transformative. And I guess the powers that be at that time did not like that. So the punishment, as you probably know, was to be tied onto a rock and be visited every day by a vulture which took his liver. And then overnight, the liver will regenerate itself and the vulture will return. So the punishment was a signal sent out to people that they were breaking the rules. People that somehow were not obeying what, what, the, what the prevailing uh, you know, powers wanted them to obey um, would, be, would be punished and would be punished in severe terms, which actually is one way of controlling everything. So when I chose the subject, I chose it because of that message that is built in, that on the one hand, you have no choice sometimes but to make what you need to make because that is the only way that you feel good with who you are. But you also have that second part, which is to pay for it and pay in, in denominations that they're pretty remarkably harsh and, 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 and very difficult. Um, the other thing that happens here with the paintings that as you've seen, they're fragmented, they're broken up into parts. Um, that comes from an idea that has been um, you know, moving around my head for some time um, about how information travels. And I think information travels not in large pieces, but rather in small parts. And we receive them not necessarily in the right order every time. Some things come before other things. But what fascinated me all of my life is that we can make up a story with as little as possible. In fact, we don't even care if the story is correct for as long as we can make a story. And so when I completed this piece, which was one painting made out of 60 pieces, uh, one day as I'm taking it down, I decided to photograph the 16 pieces, and don't ask me why 16 was the number, but I thought 16, that they look to me as interesting pieces by themselves, taken out of their overall context. And um, as I was photographing them, and then I was looking at what was missing from the piece that I was removing, actually the whole piece was still there. I mean, I, I, the question was how much do I have to take out before I actually still have a story? And even if I don't have the whole story, am I capable to make one out of the fragments of the pieces that have remained? So you're now in the middle of the painting, as opposed to be in front of the painting, because that piece over there has a, um, 46, 44 pieces. And what is missing from that painting, it is on this painting here. And so in some ways, I'm trying also to work with the idea of how information, even within a specific place, can travel. You have to, to move around, you have to be not inside a sculpture as much, but it does have a sculptural component to it, because no longer it is a flat surface where everything is recorded on. Um, the, the, the other thing that it's, it's apparent in my work is that using steel, I, I, I kind of harden a thought uh, the surface of my work and, and bolting it down, its panel having those four screws, it is to further ensure that those things will not be easily visible. Um, steel has its own capacities. I mean, it has all sort of meanings that people can attach to. Uh, so the complement here is to have some, some information that it's been put out and then to have silence, to have nothing and to have something that it's quite, quite cold in a way and forbidden. It, it kind of push you, push you out. Um, the reason that I have the reducted, and I, ca I can speak about this today, although it was never intended for this so, but after we finish installing everything here, um, we realize we're missing a box, a box of, with, with, with 16 pieces, not 16, at the time were eight pieces. And so I had a choice of putting eight more blank metal panels. Nobody would have known the difference. Or speak about what sometimes is lost simply because it's been taken out or it's been obscured by something else. So I went home, I created those four panels with the word reducted on, that, that those pieces were not really lost but rather taken out. And I came and I installed them here. And then as we begin to clean up the gallery, we found the box. So then I have the question, how do I deal with that? Do I go back and history, I mean, do I rewrite it or do I continue with that, in quotes, unfortunate thing that took place? 
and accept the accident as being part of the evolution of the work. After all, the work has evolved a number of times already. So this is what happens with the paintings. The paintings are pretty much about telling a story in some ways, not in a narrative way, but rather creating an image that speaks to those two things that I mentioned earlier, the passion to do something that it feels right, and then the outcome of such a step, which is to be punished for what you have done, uh, simply because you have veered from the guidelines. Um, then on this wall, there are four monitors which pretty much deal with contemporary images that I collected as I travel through places. Uh, at the time when I, when I use my iPhone, or we use a better camera to take an image, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to be used. Uh, I'm interested in putting them together. I know that at some point I may have to combine them, but I really do not know exactly how they will work out until, working with an editor, I begin to combine them. And of course, when I begin to combine them, they begin to bring me something that is similar to this. They are fragments, pieces of the story that they are coming into one place, relating to each other either vertically or horizontally. Um, and, 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 in, and in some ways, that's what I call transmissions. These are the kind of things that they fly through the air through all sorts of media. And sometimes they are caught, sometimes they are lost, sometimes they are interpreted, sometimes they are not. Uh, but they're about that, that chance that it's important in how the work becomes what it is. Um, all the color changes that you see, they're interventions on the original footage as a way to add maybe another, another layer to it, another way of thinking about it. So the red forest, for example, that it's over the green part was a deliberate choice on my part to separate those two things as being two different moments in, in the same space. Um, I, th I think I'm taking a little bit more time that perhaps you may have a question or maybe we can wait for that a little bit later. You want to have the question here? If there is one. Is there any immediate questions that you'd like to ask? Um, do you have one? Um, the monitors are installed rather low, um, which is, I think they work pretty well low, but I'm wondering what your concept was behind that. I, I, I don't have an answer. It was more like I'm, I'm in this space and I looked at what the space could accommodate and it felt better to be at the lower. But they have been actually, the bottom part of the monitor has been aligned with the bottom part of the painting. Mm -hmm. So there was some effort to tie those two things together. Okay, so uh, it wasn't so much about where you wanted the viewer's gauge to fall first or anything? I actually, I want them to be seen in some kind of sequence, but not necessarily from left to right or right to left, but to see them in a line of sorts, as opposed to have them spread in different places, at least for this space here. Is there something else, or we maybe want to move to the next? I think what's interesting by having him go like that for me was that it was almost like doing the walk, you know, and seeing in front of myself. You mean on this on, on, yeah. on this piece here? Like walking into them, and I, I think the walking one kind of guides that, that thinking of for me. Does that make any sense? Anyway, uh, any other I get it. You get it? Yeah, because <laughs> if, if when you're walking, we're looking ahead, and the projection is forward and low, and it's below our eyes. You know, if you're walking straight this way, you know, I mean, we don't, you're not looking at the ground. You know, we're, we're always looking a little bit low into the foreground to, um, you know, make our way and to keep ourselves, you know, steady. So I do get that yeah, first like person identification. Walking into the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. I love, my, I love how you have both on the opposite walls because uh, every time I look at this one, I keep trying to put a piece. <laughs> To this one over here, and then I keep looking and I see that you cut out pieces of the wood and make the depth a little bit in and out, not smooth as it is over here. And, I, and I'm looking at it from an angle that keeps making me look back and forth. And I like that because I keep spending a lot of time on this piece. Yeah. You know, this is part of my sculpture, I guess, interest that there are, there are different thicknesses that each, each panel has. They're not hugely different, but they are different enough. So the way that they relate to the plane, it's, it's, it's not as constant, it's not as standard. 
And I like that too. I mean, information travels in all sort of directions, and that's, that's part of what I'm trying to explore with the way that the installation works. Yeah, also, that's really interesting to me, uh, being a painter, and here, painting acts as an installation, and you can be inside the painting, because you know half of it is over there, and the other half is on the other side. So those of you who know this, uh, the tiles that are painted are the missing ones from this side, as Alex probably mentioned. Uh, so you're like inside the painting by being between the two components. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about developing something that can be broken up and reassigned, because you can imagine, I mean, this is one painting, but if I were to think of how many panels have been created over a period of time and can fly from the one group into the other, there is a remarkable range of possible ways that you can see things. And so when, when, I, when I think of a painting that is absolutely final, um, I, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for the artist that can actually close the deal. You know, you, you know you, as, as a friend of mine, you say, you go out looking for something to eat, but you seldom have what it takes to pull the trigger to make sure that you would bring food back to the house. And I, and I think there is something very admirable about people that, that they can get to it and say, this is it. On the other hand, I believe that I, as a person, too, am a work in progress. I'm, I'm, I'm made out of different pieces, and, and, I, and I always rearrange the things that I do. And, and there is a building self-cleaning mechanism that I'm sure all of us have, that we turn it on or turn it off, and that allows us to rethink the way that we have positioned ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other things. So that allows me to really express that, to really be open as to how I see the world and how I relate to things. And what's remarkable for me is that I can take portions of one painting from the one side and marry them to another one, and suddenly there is another level of, of bringing the information together, where if the pieces were entirely self-contained, then that kind of ability is not as, as, as there for me. And now, I don't know if that's something that most people would like to have to deal with if they were to acquire a piece and what, what the logistics are, are of having six individually hanged pieces as opposed to one single canvas. I mean, these are other complications, but, but from my perspective, the ability to, to, to have flexibility, to be able to revisit and to rethink and to, and to act on what I have already started, it's, it's very important for who I am and, and, the, and, the, and the interests that I have.